Okay, thank you, Susan. I think there might be some takers on your notion that there, are, there can't be a science of morality. Um, not on the grounds that it would demote it, but that it would just unnecessarily retard it. Let's see if we can find anybody who wishes to address those issues. Paul? Um, I'll have to speak up then, won't I? Paul Churchill. Uh, thank you. Um, I've been fingered, I, I must tell you, <laughs> by our mutual friend here. Um, and I've been figured because he thinks, I think, that there can be a moral science, and he's hoping I'll say something here. Uh, so let me, let me say something, and then you can tell me what you think is wrong with it. Okay. One possible take on uh, human morality... There's a hole here, just sorry. Um, yeah, go ahead. That's okay. One possible take is that... Uh, at least amongst advanced cultures, the prevailing moral uh, orthodoxy, and that will include the political orthodoxy and uh, rules for treating friends and raising children and so forth, is in fact the reflection of a long period of uh, experimentation, social experiment. We live lives under a family of laws or rules or customs, and sometimes the shoe pinches, uh, sometimes the wheels fall off, and uh, our judges change the way they interpret the law, or our legislatures change the law or add to it, and if you've got a process that goes on long enough in this vein, you end up with a system of uh, guidelines, economic, uh, political, uh, correctional, that guide the society's uh, way of life in progressively more well-informed ways. That is to say, we make moral progress at all of these levels. And it is a learning process. It's driven by experiment, uh, sometimes painful experiments, over long periods of time. And when you look at things from this point of view, the slow advance or evolution of morality doesn't look so different from the slow advance or evolution of scientific knowledge. And it's just as much to be prized. Well, you'll be surprised that I actually uh agree with you, and I'm delighted to hear somebody make the claim that there is moral progress because it's such a, uh, it can be such an incendiary thing to, to say, and it's a claim that I make myself and deeply believe in, but I don't think we make it as a matter of experiment. And um, take a couple of examples that I think are, are cases of serious moral progress uh, in recent you know, historically seeing really quite recent times, the abolition of slavery was an absolutely major step, all right? Um, and it's recent enough for us to have a fairly strong sense of what was meant there. Um, I don't, and I, I think you would actually find something close to universal consensus that humankind stepped forward when we decided to abolish slavery even though, I mean, we've come up with other forms of exploitation, but that there is a, you know, there was a major step made and in a direction that we think we ought to continue to go. What sort of experiment got made there uh, to suggest that human beings have equal rights and, and uh, that entails that you can't enslave some of them? I mean, I, I just, the notion of experiment there falls away, it seems to me. Um, that's uh, one example. I mean, so you set them free and then you realize, gosh, they're not property. They're people with souls like me. I mean, whatever, however you parse no, the No, no, the soul. experiment took place uh, um, before and we discovered that uh, we came to see or people outside came to see that slaves were living in misery. They weren't having the uh, joys of raising their own children to maturity. There were conflicts between uh, the slave owners and the slaves. Uh, there was a segment of humanity that was denied a whole range of possible kinds of uh, flourishing. And this sort of uh, realization has come uh, sooner or later to almost every uh, civilization, even going back to ancient Greece and Rome, uh, that this isn't worth it. Uh, the advances but, you gain, and, and so we change our customs. But you had, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure how important the disagreement between us is, but let me just um, make two further comments. I mean, um, you had in the American South a very serious body of, of 
literature and of people uh, making speeches and discussing to the order that the southern system was the more moral one. It was the more genuinely humane one. It, uh, you know, that northern, the northern form of exploitation was in fact much more brutal and caused much more pain and suffering than, um, than southern slavery. And the studies that I've read on the subject are really quite equivocal. That is, it seems very hard to weigh the um, suffering caused by leaving people homeless and working 14 hours a day, seven days a week, and you know, living in horrid conditions and so on and so on, and having no one care for them in, in sickness and old age. Um, it's hard to weigh that with the, the fundamental indignity of being someone else's property and knowing that even if they treat you reasonably well, it's contingent and you belong to them. I mean, those are two quite different values. And at a certain point, it was said, look, um, what we value is actually this innate human dignity that's um, violated by the notion of slavery. So I'm not sure that this was something that people came to see. Just one other point, which I think is extremely important today about the notion of moral progress. One of the great moral advances of the Enlightenment was uh, abolishing torture. And it's interesting to think about how far we've come when we think about the fact that 300 years ago, in virtually every square of every civilized city, certainly in Europe, mm -hmm. uh, torturing people to death was something not just that took place, but that you would have taken your children to go and see on a Saturday afternoon, right? I mean, that's what was happening now. Um, the question is, what did people learn empirically when they decided, oh gosh, drawing and quartering actually causes too much suffering? I think we'll, um, you know, uh, put it, put it out. I mean, I don't think that there, there's, a, there's a fact that changed there that somebody had to realize. I think the example, by the way, is particularly important because while it shows that there can be moral progress, it shows that it's absolutely not necessary and there can also be moral regression as in the case of the current administration. Um, but I don't see that what's taking place somehow when Bush decides to legalize torture and thereby cancel one of the major achievements of the Enlightenment, I don't see, or he had, right? I mean, many achievements of the Enlightenment, but that one in particular. Um, I don't see that what's happened is that um, there's something that he doesn't know that he could somehow be tutored on. Um, Jim Woodward over there. You... Yeah, uh, I, I can, can you hear me? No, but the, we can, but it won't go on tape. <laughs> That's the issue. That's the limiting thing to hear. Um, well, I, I wanted to just say a couple of quick things about this issue of the, um, the role of empirical information in uh, moral um, thinking and reasoning and so on. And first of all, to uh, support what uh, Paul just said, uh, I think the example of torture is a really interesting one because it seems to me that um, there was real moral learning and learning about, in, in the context of learning about empirical facts uh, going on uh, in the events that led up to the abolition of torture. So for example, people uh, learned that uh, torture simply didn't work very well in uh, providing, you know, getting the kinds of information that they hoped to get from it. Uh, they learned um, something, again, that the current administration doesn't seem to understand, that um, you can't sort of localize torture if you try to you know, set up a system in which torture is allowed only in very speci specified circumstances. It tends to uh, sort of get out and, uh, and infect everything, and it uh, attracts people uh, with the worst sort of motivations and so on and so forth. And I think um, that if you go back and look at the historical record, you'll see those arguments um, of that empirical sort being made. In fact, those arguments are being made today um, uh, by uh, people who are opposed to uh, uh, the kind of torture practices that uh, our government is engaged in. So that's just specifically on, on, on the question of torture. And then um, more generally, let me suggest one way in which, um, uh, somewhat different way in which empirical information can be relevant to um, moral theorizing. And this is that uh, we may learn, different moral theories, it seems to me, rest on various ideas about uh, human motivation and, and, and what sorts of uh, 
motives are uh, at least sufficiently, are sufficiently frequently available to us that they can uh, motivate significant numbers of people to action. Um, and it seems to me if you learn as an empirical matter that uh, some motivation that you thought uh, was uh, common and easily relied on is very uncommon and not so uh, uh, readily uh, uh, relied on or available, that has a bearing on uh, uh, a normative theory. So a theory, for example, that requires that we uh, be unconditional altruists, it seems to me, is hostage to um, the whole question of whether you know, actual human beings um, uh, behave in that way. Um, so I, what I'm suggesting is that um, empirical information about motivation can act as a, it, it can help sort of constrain uh, uh, the space of possible moral theories, even though you don't get in that anything like a derivation of, a, uh, of an ought from an is. Um, that's perfectly fine with me. And just, I mean, on a personal note, um, I was trained as a philosopher, but I, I run an interdisciplinary institute so that I get to learn empirical things sometimes from other people. I mean, I, I, I'm the last person who thinks that uh, empirical information isn't relevant. On the contrary, I think philosophers, uh, you know, should work with more of it. So, um, of course, empirical information is relevant to, um, to moral theory. I'm just arguing that it's not determinant. And again, the torture case is, uh, it's, in a certain sense, it's a beautiful example of the way in the real world self-interest and moral interest do often work together. That is, it turns out to be the case that torture is not very effective. And so if you're dealing with someone who has no moral qualms whatsoever, like Donald Rumsfeld, um, it might be worth pointing out that you know it's not in his interest to continue a policy that's simply feeding us false information. I mean, we're somebody where you know that the, you know, the, the moral, whatever part of the brain deals with moral reactions, they're defunct in that, uh, you know, in some point. But, but um, it's a good thing that we've found that out. It's a bit of argument that we can use to make abolishing torture more uh, appealing to people. But supposing it did, I mean, the whole point is, you know, you're talking about two very, very different levels of, of objection, right? Supposing it were true that every time you tortured someone, uh, they actually revealed uh, what you couldn't get revealed in some other way. Would you then continue torturing? Because the pro I mean, one of the problems with um, those arguments is that someone like Rumsfeld or whomever will be able to come up with a case of somebody who was tortured and did reveal something that, that intelligence wanted to know. Uh, there'll be 70 other cases in which it didn't, but they'll be able to come up with one case, and then what do you say? Well, it, it's all right? Um, Scott Atran, you've been waiting to ask a question. Yes, um, well, Except for the gratuitous m remark about Rumsfeld, I found this talk to be one of the most enlightening, a sort of little flicker as I watch this audience drive like blind car racers off a cliff. I think in science there is progress. This is the case, and postmodernism may doubt it, but I think it's wrong. But in politics and ethics, not in the cases of the grizzly bear, but in the politics and ethics and history, progress is, if anything, fitful and it's reversible. As Menachem Begin once said, civilization is intermittent. And liberty and freedom are recurrently won and lost in alternating cycles of war and violence, and there's no evidence whatsoever that that is changing one iota. And I don't see science, although there may be in some ideal world the possibility, the possibility of a scientific moral ethics, I certainly don't see in this audience the slightest indication that people here are emotionally or intellectually equipped to deal with the facts of changing human knowledge in the context of unchanging human needs that haven't changed much since the Pleistocene. And I don't see there's any evidence that science is being used 
to try to understand the people you are trying to convince to join you. So, for example, the statements we've heard here about Islam in this audience are worse than any comic book statement that I have heard about it and make the classic, comic, the classic comic books look like the Encyclopedia Britannica compared to what we've been hearing here. Statements about who the jihadis are, who a suicide bomber is, what a religious experience is except for one person. You haven't the slightest idea. You haven't produced one single fact. You haven't produced one single bit of knowledge. Not a single bit. Every case provided here is an N of one, our own intuition, or one's self-intuition, except for Rama, who had an N of two, one brain patient. Okay? Luckily, we had some diversity. And from there, generalizations are made about religion, about what to do about religion, about how science is to engage or not engage religion, about what is rubbish and what is not. It strikes me that if you ever really want to be serious and you want to engage the public to make it a more peaceful and compassionate world, you've got to get real. You've got to get some data. You've got to get some knowledge. And you can't trust your own intuitions about how the world is. Be scientists. There is no indication whatsoever that anything we've heard about other people shows any evidence of scientific inquiry.